Okay, yeah. Uh, all right. Oh, I'm, yeah, I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you everyone for attending today's call. Um, this is a work, this work that I've done with Adarsh. We are in the same lab, Peter Adams lab at the Sanford Burn and Previs. And today we're gonna to talk about the, the model, our final model that we generated for Kafka 5. Uh, so to start with, uh, we're gonna go through um, these different topics. Uh, one of the differences that we have done compared to the other presentations today is we have done a little bit of functional validation at the very end. So hopefully this is a sort of a different perspective and a different way to sort of uh, validate the solution that we have uh, engineered for this problem. So some background to start with, uh, both Adarsh and I, we are PhD candidates at uh, SVP, as we like to call Sanford Burn and Prabis. Uh, our thesis work in the lab is focused on molecular biology and cellular senescence. So we have actually very little training and background uh, with machine learning and data science in general. And this was our, both of us our first carrot competition. So there was a lot of learning, a lot of uh, improvements that came along as we participated. And the long length of the competition also helped uh, our progress in that regard. Uh, the tool that we have generated, we are calling ProtGoat, is Protein Gene Ontology Annotation Tool. Uh, the core of it is essentially using very simple dense neural networks to extract information from these uh, protein embeddings as well as from some text data that we generated. And essentially, we have separate models for each uh, individual Go domain, BPO, CCO, MFO. Uh, so for feature selection engineering, uh, I probably don't really need to introduce protein language models to this audience. They are very powerful tools. They can predict a very diverse range of characteristics for proteins. Uh, the ones that we have used, uh, the main ones were from the Burkhardt Ross lab, as well as from Meta, ESM, and ProT5. Uh, and yeah, they're just fantastic tools, and we're very excited to be using them during this competition. So. Again, these, pro these protein language models, they are just quite remarkable in that they can predict such a diverse range of characteristics based on this very simple objective of trying to predict uh, amino acids that are being masked during the training of these models. So I think this is uh, uh, what everyone else has done during the competition is to just take embeddings produced from these models and just average over each amino acid to get this sort of uh, a uh, single line of uh, just float point uh, digits. So again, this is uh, fairly basic for this audience. So we'll go over this quite quickly. Um, a bit more detail in terms of how we did the, the feature selection. Uh, we used 1,500 terms for BPO and 800 terms for CCO and MF MFO. Uh, we selected the terms based on a simple uh, multiplication of frequency in the training data set to the IA uh, value, which is the weight of how valuable predicting that term is. During training, uh, any proteins that did not have labels for the respective ontology would be dropped during the training of that respective model. And when we generate embeddings for our proteins, uh, due to computational constraints, we truncated any proteins with length of over 3,000 amino acids. Uh, when making embeddings. So one other feature that we use that I think is uh, relatively unique among the top submissions is to use uh, text data. So as we all know, uh, proteins, uh, these uh, Go annotations, they are from literature and literature is reflected in the papers that are generated for each protein. So what we did was, is that we took uh, abstract uh, information uh, linked to each protein and we took out, um, we basically tabulated the frequency of certain words in these abstracts. And the vocabulary of the words that we use for this tabulation is derived directly from the names of gene ontology uh, labels. So based on this, we could create a count matrix for these uh, vocabulary words based on these abstracts. And you could generate something like a word cloud from this uh, count matrix with TF idea uh, that, uh, that's demonstrated over here. So the normalization for that count is with TF idea essentially. So uh, 
those are the two main inputs, protein uh, embeddings as well as text data. And one other thing that we also used was um, taxonomy, one hot, one hot encoding. So the final model input um, are these uh, various data sources. Um, obviously, some of the protein language models perform better on their own compared to others. ProBert, I think, is uh, generally known to perform the least effectively among all these uh, PLMs. So, oh, a great question about how to find literature for a test protein. Uh, since the test proteins, we have all the protein IDs, um, it was actually very straightforward. We, we just use uh, the protein names to get uh, text data. Um, so that was, uh, I mean, the, the, the methodology for training and tests was, was very similar. So uh, training methods, uh, the model that we use actually took in these inputs as sort of separate and fed them into uh, their own sort of stack of layers before concatenating the output into um, this multi-label classification scheme. The final output is sort of this sigmoid um, layer that uh, tries to uh, look at which protein, uh, which label is associated with which protein. So it's a very basic dense neural network. Uh, you could generate this in like 20 minutes. Um, and the training time is actually very low for these uh, models as well. So a bit more details that we train our models in Google Colab. Uh, we use five for cross-validation and we actually use five different uh, seeds for train validation split. So for each Go domain, we did all of these. So that's 25 models for each Go domain, 75 models in total. We average predictions for each Go domain across all the models uh, with uh, the weights were identical for each model. And then we concatenated the results before submission. One thing that we introduced was uh, weights uh, for each label, which we again calculated as IA times frequency. So the model during training would weigh different labels, uh, different, uh, but weigh them differently based on how important those labels are. Uh, out of all the predictions we generated, we simply took the top 5% for submission. So we observed that our model, even though it's quite simple actually converges uh, uh, rapidly during training. Um, and you can see that it quite rapidly starts overfitting. So this was an issue that we had as we iterated through different uh, architecture details to try and figure out a way to, to minimize this. And in the end, it was sort of just trying different layer sizes and just, um, and I think we, yeah, different regularization methods as well. Um, and of course, the final model that we use uh, out for all of them is just based on the lowest loss in the validation set. So some important interesting findings we observe is that, uh, first of all, we found that the BCE loss that we use uh, track really well with the FMAX score from the um, public leaderboard uh, data set. We tried various other loss functions, um, one of which is uh, we, we tried quite a bit, it took like a week to, to find out that it didn't work was this hierarchical loss function. Um, don't, yeah, it, it, we just couldn't find a better way other than BC for our training. So uh, other than that, um, we also did an ablation study at the end of the competition to see um, what happens when we slowly remove the inputs to our models. We observe that actually when we remove the inputs, quite interestingly, uh, MFO uh, by itself seems to improve a bit, whereas BPO and CCO decrease. Overall performance does go down as we decrease the complexity of our model. But the fact that, you know, at least in one of these domains, it's actually improving suggests that we uh, have not done that great a job making this model and they're probably overfitting at some point. We have also tried looking at, um, during the competition, we ensembled our model with various public uh, data sets, uh, public submissions based on these public notebooks on Kaggle. And in the end, we found that actually this ensembling didn't really 
make a big difference to the performance of a model. In fact, it seemed to actually decrease performance uh, overall with this ensembling, which uh, suggests that these public submissions um, tend, tend to overfit. They, they tend to overfit and was not that useful in the end for us. So other than that, we tried comparing the performance of a model with these uh, sort of state-of-the-art machine learning models. And we found that um, by itself, this sort of dense neural network uh, approach seemed to outperform these, these other alternative uh, machine learning models quite a bit. Um, these values here are actually taken directly from public notebooks on Kaggle, which other people have used to run. Uh, the great question, how to use FOSIC for goal prediction? Uh, well, FOSIC is based, I believe, uh, primarily on this protein structural data. I don't have a detailed understanding of how they use it specifically for this. Uh, yeah, great questions. Um, so we did not retrain SPRA for Deep Go Plus. We, this is a very naive approach. We simply took the uh, submissions from these public notebooks. I think a more thorough approach would be actually to um, evaluate these models uh, ourselves and try to either you know prevent underfitting or overfitting because these um, can quite easily do that. But this is sort of a very simple uh, way of looking at the, the performance on the final test set from Kafka 5. Yeah. So uh, one last thing that we try to look at is sort of functional validation. So our lab is interested in cellular senescence, and so are we. And this is a, a biological process, which is a conserved cellular response to external stress. And it's characterized by this permanent uh, halt to uh, the cell cycle and replication. And it's an important hallmark of um, aging. So as part of the process of cellular senescence, there's a very distinct change in the transcriptome of these cells which is called the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or SAS. And this is very well documented in these uh, human cell lines which have undergone senescence, but in the literature, it's not that well annotated, these genes. So what we did is we took our model and we look at uh, which of the labels that we predicted are associated, uh, are cellular senescence. And of these labels from the test set. Yeah, so this is from the test set. And we found 489 proteins to be predicted with this cellular senescence label. And out of these proteins, the vast majority of them, 429, do not have any annotations currently for cellular senescence. And of these 429, we found 257 of these were in our um, RNA-seq data. They are human genes that are expressed in our human fibroblast cell lines. And we wanted to take a, a closer look at what these genes look like from our data sets. So uh, we actually found that uh, comparing the existing genes that are annotated for cell senescence and the predicted genes, we found very similar patterns in terms of the expression uh, uh, levels, uh, expression patterns in our data sets. So you can see clearly when cells undergo, senes undergo senescence, uh, most of these genes either uh, dramatically increase or dramatically decrease. And we found that the um, the enrichment score for these genes, which are predicted from our data, uh, from our model, is uh, is highly significant. So that is um, all that we have for today. Uh, happy to take questions.